In this episode of Ask Paul Kirtley, we're going to talk about natural midge repellents, processing horses' hoof fungus, tarp setups and kit weight, sleep rotation for fire watch, fire deflectors, and Plantagio Major as a healing agent. Welcome, welcome to episode 56 of Ask Paul Kirtley, where I answer your questions on wilderness bushcraft, survival skills, and outdoor life. Now the year progresses apace. I've been very busy running programs around the country and planning more coming up in August and September, trips abroad as well. So there's a lot going on. I'm gonna try and record Aspore Kirtley's as I go. Um, didn't manage to get one done in the Lake District, unfortunately, but you did see what we did on that day instead. Um, certainly on my YouTube channel and on my blog, you can see that River Crake trip that we did on the, on the day off between those two programs that we did in the lakes. But I'm hoping to get some Aspore Kirtley's recorded around the country. Also, my podcast is being resurrected as well. I had James Raffin on for episode 20. I've got Sarita Robinson on episode 21. And if that isn't released already, by the time you're watching this, it will be very, very soon. That's available on my blog and on iTunes and on Stitcher and various other platforms as well. Just search for the Paul Kirtley podcast. And on YouTube, I will put a link to uh, the main page on my blog for that podcast so you can then go out whether you want RSS, iTunes, Stitcher, Apple Podcasting app or just to listen to it on my blog. You can do it all from there and they're really good informative interview based uh, podcasts normally. I do do some other in-between episodes if you like. I've got some planned but the, the bulk of those are guests experts, people with experience in different areas of outdoor life or experiences of nature, experiences of expeditioning, experiences of uh, native peoples or whatever it is around the subject of bushcraft and the skill set and knowledge within bushcraft, there's something there for you, um, whether it's backpacking, lightweight trekking, um, expeditions in remote places, um, indigenous skills, all sorts of stuff there. Check those out if you don't know about them already. They are a separate stream of podcasts to the Aspore Kirtley podcasts and I'm excited about what's coming up there. More coming in the pipeline, so keep an eye on those. But anyway, on to today's business without further ado. First question is from Danny Barrett and he asks, Hi Paul, is there a plant in the UK that can be used as a midge repellent? If so, what is it and have you ever used it? Thanks for all the great blogs and episodes you've done so far, Danny Barrett. Well, Danny, uh, yes, there is a plant that you can use as a natural midge repellent. Uh, it's called bog myrtle. Uh, one of the other names for it is Sweet Gale. And it is a plant generally of peat bogs, boggy moorland around the margins of uh, forests, often in Scotland, um, onto the moors in Scotland, but you find it in many other places as well. Um, it occurs right around the Northern Hemisphere. I found it in uh, Canada on canoe trips as well. And in fact, I did a little YouTube video um, a number of years ago now, a couple of years ago, where we were on a short portage trail. Um, I was with Ben, uh, my friend and, and a guy who's a cameraman, and we were filming various films out there um, for one of my online programs. And we stopped on this portage trail um, just me and him, no big, no big camera crew or production crew. It's just me and him in a canoe out in the woods um, uh, and, a, and a camera uh, doing, uh, making films. But we stopped on the portage trail and um, it was quite infested with mosquitoes mainly, this, this portage trail. And at the end of this portage trail where the put-in was, where the water came into the end of the trail, there was a bunch of 
bog myrtle and so I grabbed this and I was rubbing it on my arms and, uh, and elsewhere on you know, face and neck and what have you and it does help to an extent I mean it doesn't st I don't think anything stops all insects from biting you other than being covered in netting um, or clothing but it does certainly help it helps with mosquitoes and it helps with midges as well some natural I can't remember the brand names but some natural insect repellents have been made using uh, bog myrtle and you can also make insect repellents yourself using bog myrtle and this is a very timely question Danny um, we did an article on the Frontier Bushcraft blog so not the Paul Kirtley blog we did a, a team blog on the Frontier Bushcraft blog about ways that we deal with creepy crawlies in the outdoors whether it's close to home or further afield and, and myself and some other members of the Frontier Bushcraft team put in little uh, snippets of information there and, and things we've got experience with and what works and, and what doesn't and one of the things that Alison mentioned was her bog myrtle balm that she made using uh, bog myrtle and pine resin and oil and um, it's and a little bit of beeswax as well and um, it was something that people asked about and so Alison then wrote a separate article recently on how she made that um, and some other properties that she discovered almost inadvertently that that balm has so it was made as an insect repellent but it also has some qualities as a balm as a soothing agent as an antiseptic and that's all on the Frontier Bushcraft blog so in the show notes on paulkirtley.co.uk I know this gets a little bit confusing sometimes because most of my content personal stuff to do with me is on paulkirtley.co.uk but I do have Frontier Bushcraft which is my uh, training company if you like it's the company through which I organize courses I offer courses I offer training courses in bushcraft I offer training courses in canoeing and canoe expeditions and all of those things are within the Frontier Bushcraft remit. That's the kind of legal entity and that has the systems and the people that deliver that, including myself and Ray Goodwin and Spoons and all those other guys that you may know about, Alison and Henry. Um, we all work within Frontier Bushcraft to deliver those training courses. And so there is a website, FrontierBushcraft.com, and there is a blog on there as well where um, the team write things and I write things about Frontier. So that's sort of separate to what I do on my personal blog. Um, so if you listen to this on the podcast, um, go to the show notes at paulkirtley.co.uk and I will link to all of those things there. If you're watching this on YouTube, again, go to paulkirtley.co.uk, show notes, episode 56, I will link to all of those things. So yeah, bog myrtle, you can rub it on as is, just crush the leaves, or you can get a little bit more sophisticated like Alison did and make your own insect repellent out of it as well. Processing horse's hoof fungus. This is a question from Instagram from Gavin Henry. Good to hear from you again, Gavin. Hope you're well. Um, his question, he's got a picture of some somewhat damp looking uh, Fomus fermentarius, horse's hoof fungus. And he says, how do you process horse's hoof fungus? It feels damp inside. Yeah, well, it might be damp inside. Horse's hoof fungus, Fomus fermentarius, is a fungus which grows over a number of years. It isn't one of these fungi fruiting bodies which just fruits, it sprouts, it, it spores and it's done in a quick, quick process. It grows slowly and you get those growth rings over a number of years. Equally, once it's died off, um, it sits there for quite some time as well and it can become kind of full of uh, grubs, it can become very soggy and almost rotten on the inside. So sometimes you will pull them off and it will be certainly past its best. But equally, when it's little woodpecker going over there, chick, um, it will be uh, at its prime at certain stages. And if it's alive still, it will be, if, as you pull it off, it will be somewhat damp sometimes. And so you may just have to dry it out. In terms of processing, it depends exactly what you want to do with it. Um, in terms of fire lighting, it's the trammer layer that you're interested in. So it's not the outer dermis, the sclera, the hard. It's almost like eggshell on the outside. When you tap it, it's quite hard. It's not that bit that you're interested in, nor is it the spore tubes, which are at the bottom. And if, if you cut it through, like you have done, you can, it's broken, the one that you've got. Those 
straight lines going down through a good amount of the body are the spore tubes. It's not that, it's the trammer layer which sits between the hard outer dermis and the spore tubes that you're interested in and you want slices of that. Now the one that you've got broken there looks like it doesn't have much trammer layer actually and it also looks like it's a bit rotten, it's a bit past its best and that's probably why you're struggling to, to wonder how you might use it. It's because it's not a great example Gavin. But generally what you want to do is take slices of that trammer layer and when it's in good condition it will come out in slices somewhat like a piece of chamois leather, somewhere between a piece of chamois leather and buckskin. It has that sort of consistency and that texture on the surface. It's a little bit fluffy around the edges, on the thin edges. And with a modern sparking device, if that's actually dry, um, with a modern sparking device, that trammer layer, you can drop a spark straight onto it and it will start smouldering and then that's your ember and then you can take it to a tinder bundle, blow it to flame, get your fire going, for example. That's one way you can use it with a modern fire steel. And in fact, um, I many years ago, I wrote an article on that on my blog at paulkirtley.co.uk um, called something like the easy way to use horses, hoofs, fungus, something like that. And that was... Um, that was uh, an example. Uh, those photographs were taken in Canada, actually. So this is a fungus which occurs in North America, Europe, Scandinavia, right around, again, Northern Hemisphere. And a lot of people confuse it with artist bracket, Ganoderma aplanatum, but that has, uh, it's more of a bracket shape. It's less um, rounded. It's more flat. It's got white spore tubes on the underside and if you score them they go a, a cocoa brown color um, and that's why it was used as a like a natural etch-a-sketch um, horse's hoof fungus by contrast is is more like a hoof it has typically creamy or uh, almost like latte coffee colored um, spore tubes on the underside and the trammer layer is, is generally thicker, although well, the one that you've got there is quite thin. So that's one, the simple way these days, the, the old, more old fashioned way of dealing with it when you've got smaller sparks, uh, less hot sparks, is you take that trammer layer, that slice of trammer layer, and you boil it in an alkali solution. And you pound it, you make sure that that solution is well permeated into that piece of fungus and then you leave it to dry and then you need to scrape up the surface so it's fluffy and then use your flint and steel say to drop a spark in there and it, it will then catch a spark from more traditional methods such as flint and steel and if you want to go uh, even more difficult if you like um, you can use um, you can use iron py pyrites <coughs> and fool's gold and a piece of flint for example uh, to try and drop a very small spark and that is the way that people uh, possibly used sparks initially the first regularly used uh, fire by sparks fire by percussion if you like but we don't know we don't know for sure um, certainly you know celebrated examples such as Utzi uh, carrying bits of Fomus fermentarius bits of um, birch polypore and the means to light fire by sparks as well. So it's, it's possible, it's possible. Um, certainly Ertzi and, and those people, that's not that long ago. We kind of keep looking at Ertzi and kind of going, it's a, it's a window into the past and it is in a way, but it isn't that long ago. It's not that long ago, you know, if we're, if we're looking back hundreds of thousands of years or even millions of years, who knows what the first percussion technique that was used was, um, hard to say, but Iron pyrites and flint definitely works and it definitely works onto prepared firmus fermentarius but it does take some time to get that little spark onto the piece of fungus. But as I say, good quality trammer layer, sliced, boiled in a lye solution. Easiest way to make a lye solution in the woods, take some ash from your fire, um, generally quite alkali, mix it with water, boil up the slices of trammer layer in a billy can, take them out, leave them to dry, fluff them up, drop a spark, it should work. With any fire lighting though, it needs to be dry. Yeah. So the first thing you should be trying to do, even with things like Daldinia concentrica, which is King Alfred's cake or cramp balls, um, they don't work if, unless they're dry. You can take them off a dead ash tree 
and the consistency they need to have to work, what tells you if they're dry is they, they feel like expanded polystyrene, they're very low density. Um, if they're not, if they're heavier and they're full of water, um, you try and drop sparks onto those, they won't light. So any fire lighting, the medium that you're trying to drop sparks into, with the, maybe the exception of birch bark, which can get away with being a little bit damp on the outside, just because there's so much oil in there, water doesn't really soak in very much. Um, with that exception, everything needs to be dry. And if you're not having success with something because it feels damp, that's the primary issue often. Okay, tarp setups and kit weight from Matthew Clues. And he says, hi Paul, shamefully I have recently found your content and love it. I think you mean shamefully you've only recently found it. It's not that you found it, that there's some shame in that. I know what you mean, I think. My question is two pronged. First is when pitching a tarp, do you prefer a high flat setup or a low to the ground triangle tent style and why? I'm in the latter camp at the minute, but saw your video of you in the rain under the tarp. Second is pack weight. I've read a lot about percentages of body weight, etc. I have a spreadsheet with all my kit and kit variants so I can plan my load out, but is the best mindset to pack for a scenario, e.g. leisurely comfort, long hike, seasons, uh, sorry, long hike, seasons, obviously, or based on target total weight? How do you track weight loadout? There's a lot of questions in there, there's almost more than two, but um, tarp. I think you need to set your tarp based on a number of things. One is the size of the tarp, for starters. Um, you can get away with a higher tarp setup if it's bigger. Although, uh, for example, last night it was a very stormy, windy night. It lashed it with rain most of the night. Um, and I had been using uh, one of Alpkit's bigger, no, no connection with Alpkit. I like their equipment. I have a number of things from them, but I'm not, there's no kind of backdoor sponsorship there or product placement. Um, one of their bigger tarps, I was using it as a workspace yesterday with a student um, because it was showering on and off during the day and we were working on various things. We we're just out in the woods for the day and I brought the tarp with me. It's silicon nylon tarp. It's quite small, but it gives a good amount of space that you can work under, move around under. And I left that up and I, I slept under that last night. And it's high enough to stand up under. And in the, in the middle, certainly. And there was a bit of rain blowing in from the side. It was very windy, little rain blowing in from the side under the shadow of the tarp, if you like. But if I put that tarp lower so that I could just sit up under it, you wouldn't have got the rain coming under the side. So it, the height is part of it. And, you know, I was in a bivy bag, in my sleeping bag. There was no water on the bivy bag. You know, I was in the middle of the tarp. It's just there was a little bit coming in the side because it is, you know, it's seven foot off the ground and it was blowing a gale. So if you're using a smaller personal tarp, if you set it lower, then you're not gonna get the rain coming in the side. It's the gap between the ground <laughs> and the tarp is where the rain um, might come in. And people say, oh, you know, you always get wet in tarps. No, we've been there and the video that you're talking about refers to that. But clearly the smaller the tarp, you know, the, the smallest tarp that I've got which you can see in one of my lightweight tarp setup videos. I'll link to it on YouTube because it's on YouTube and I'll put a link to it in the show notes as well. Um, the, that lightweight setup does still keep me dry, but you have to set the tarp lower in order to provide the dry space. If I was to set that little tarp six foot off the ground and you get any angle of rain at all, and you don't need, you don't get much in the, even last night in the, in the woods, it was very windy. Uh, the trees were moving around a lot. Um, it, outside of the woods, it was, it, you could really feel the wind. In the woods, it was blowing around a lot. The foliage was blowing around a lot. But 
and I'm on, on top of a hill here as well, so it's a little bit more exposed, even though I'm in the woods because the wind's coming into the sides of the trees as opposed to being in a flat area where you get more, get more protection from the stand of trees. I'm in quite a large area of woodland, but I'm on one of the highest points here. And so the wind was definitely blowing through and under the tarp. There was a little bit of rain coming in, but even so, the angle isn't that great. It's not like being up in the mountains where you get sideways rain on a regular basis. The woods definitely deflect the wind a lot. You can have some space under a tarp and operate under a tarp without getting much water under it. One of the biggest things I see with people um, with tarps is just not setting them right, not setting them so that they're tight. The number of saggy, sloppily pitched tarps that I see pictures of around the internet is incredible. Just get the thing tight for starters, that will help water run off. And then the other thing that I see people do, particularly with bigger tarps, is not get the is not get one corner lower than the other so the water's slewing off towards the corner. People put them horizontal and then they don't get them tight, they sag in the middle, you get water pooling and you damage your tarp, it doesn't work efficiently, flaps around in the wind. Get the thing tight, learn to do some good knots, learn to do some good adjustable guy line hitches, learn how to do uh, how to attach poles on the corners if you need to, to pitch the height exactly where you need it. Get good at those basics and then you can be flexible with how you set your tarp. And as I say, the smaller the tarp, the lower it needs to be for a given sideways wind, if you like, but you're never gonna get rain coming absolutely sideways. So I rarely bring a tarp all the way down to the ground. You just don't need to. Um, I like to set a tarp, whatever the size, personally, so this will answer your question now. <laughs> I like to set it so that I can sit up underneath it that's the height so um, and, and really around about somewhere between sternum height and belly button height for most people if you if you tie your tarp off at the tree and you tie it tight at around that level it means that when you sit down you should be able to get your head under the apex while sitting up take jackets jumpers on and off and be able to hang things up above you now clearly if you've got a bigger tarp and you set it at that height, you can bring the edges closer down to the ground if you want to. Um, and that brings us on to angles. I don't like too flat a tarp because it's not gonna shed the water. I do not want something. I wanna to go to sleep at night knowing that that tarp is going to look after me, whatever happens. So yes, the rain drumming on the taut tarp, thrumming on the top might wake me up when the rain starts, but I'm not going to wake up worried that the tarps not the knots are not going to hold that the water's going to run under the tarp that the uh, because of the way that uh, the, the lay of the land that the water's not going to run off the right parts of the tarp so it doesn't either come back underneath or just drip onto me or anything I want it set up so whatever happens the heavens open that I just go yeah okay it's raining and I go back to sleep that's the way I like to set my tarp and it doesn't need to be particularly flat, even with a big tarp, um, because you then again risk pooling. The biggest issue with big tarps is that you don't get them tight enough and you don't get the angles right so that water runs off them and then you get pooling. And then when you get pooling, that might start pulling pegs out, you might stretch the tarp, it might start dripping through a seam, etc., etc., or it might just suddenly, uh, what you do, certainly don't want, and I've, I've, I've heard of this happening a few times, is you get a you know, a couple of gallons of water building up on a tarp, one of the pegs comes out, the tarp swings and you get a load of water coming down right next to where you're sleeping or even on top of you. So um, do make sure it's all set right. And that's the, that's the main thing. Um, sometimes I have used a couple of small tarps like the Australian hoochies, a good way of setting them. If you want more of a tent style shelter, use two, if you're with a, with a friend who's got a similar shelter, they've got press studs along the edge, you can press stud them together, you can put a central ridge line across and that can be a tautly uh, tied a cord across between two trees or it can be um, an, a couple of upright Y poles with a, with a cross beam across between them and then you can make more of an A-frame shelter where that's actually pegged down to the ground. So it's like an open-ended tent if you like and you've got more room inside still. Um, you, could, you can make enough room uh, for four people to sleep in a 
two hoochies put together like that when you can only really get one person under each uh, when you're sleeping out with them individually set as a, a tarp at that sternum height that we're talking about or even lower if you want to set them a bit more tactically if you like so um, I look at the size of the tarp I look at the prevailing weather conditions um, if I'm in a relatively exposed place you know so if we're right on the edge of the woods then clearly you, you're, you're more exposed to the wind you're more likely to get water coming side, more sideways you're going to have to set it lower or maybe set one side lower those are the sorts of considerations that I take um, when I'm when I'm looking at a tarp and yes, I do look at um, when I'm planning what trips I'm doing, what size tarp might be sensible. So, you know, if I'm out in the woods in the summer, um, I use that lightweight tarp that you've seen, that small silicon nylon tarp that's in that video that I linked to. That's the smallest tarp I've got. I'm still happy to set that at sternum height um, in the woods in the summer. I can sit up underneath it. It's gonna keep rain off. Um, it's not a big space I wouldn't want to be living under it and operating out of it um, at a base camp for example and I tend to take a slightly bigger tarp for that you know if I'm running courses and I might have um, spare clothes spare equipment and other things that I want to keep while I'm living under a tarp rather than just stopping for a night bedding down moving on the next day living out of a rucksack um, I might take a slightly bigger tarp for that uh, I have an MEC tarp which I like MEC uh, scout tarp in silicon nylon that's good and I've also got a, a venerable Hilleberg XP10 which is my sort of standard uh, one that I take to the woods and you've seen that in my uh, videos about and blogs about you know basic um, bushcraft camping equipment so that's another one that I use and then I've got a number of expedition size ones more for group use as well but of course you can sleep under those as well um, you can have multiple people sleeping under a larger tarp of course as well so horses for courses look at the conditions look at the exposure and uh, you know time of year do you need, do you want to have a fire underneath it all of those sorts of things all all feed into how i set the tarp um, i'm not dogmatic what I don't like is unnecessarily putting it really, really close to the ground without thinking about it and having to crawl in and out like a little dog kennel when I don't need to be. Um, I prefer to give myself the space if I can. Pack weight. Uh, percentage of body weight. Yeah, the old adage was don't carry more than 30% of your body weight. Um, I My weight has gone up over the years um, I'm currently about it's it's interesting it's interesting when I used to do a lot of backpacking like lots of backpacking I was all that was also a period of my life where I was doing a lot of mountain biking a lot of cycling and I was very lean um, I had a lot of leg strength most of my body strength was in my legs and my lower back um, because of cycling and and then also hiking and I found that if I, at that point, I was maybe 80 kilos, 70 to 80 kilos back in those days. I'm 90 to 100 these days. Um, what I found was, and this is this is interesting, um, when I when I was in the sort of 75 to 80, 75 kilo bracket, let's say, I found carrying 30% of my body weight really difficult. Um, particularly if you know even though my legs were strong I, I just my shoulders ached and I I know how to put a ruck before people write in I know how to put a rucksack on properly I know how to get the weight onto my hips etc 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 I'm talking about walking for many days carrying heavy loads my body used to struggle with that not from a leg perspective but just generally um, used to find it fatiguing um, whereas now I can't say I would enjoy carrying 30 kilos, but I find a, a, any given load easier to do. I've got more upper body strength. Um, part of that's canoeing, part of it's doing jujitsu for years. Part of it is just, uh, I guess, more balanced. When I am working out and I can't always, you know, when I'm in the woods, I don't do any sort of workouts. I'm just working in the woods, teaching in the woods, traveling in the woods. But then when I'm at home, I do try and do some things to maintain strength. And I guess I'm a bit more balanced in that um, than maybe when I was focused on cycling. 
where it was all about for me it was all about kind of legs and leg strength and yeah I did latterly start doing some things with arms and lower back and what have you but even so the point is that I find find now even though I'm heavier and this is the point I don't have the cardiovascular absolute fitness that I had when I was younger and I was lighter I find it easier to carry heavy loads now than I did when I was lighter but maybe stronger in terms of my leg strength and my cardiovascular uh, capabilities. So um, that's, that's an interesting one. So I think where I'm coming to with that, that 30% of body weight or any percentage of body weight, it needs to be taken with a pinch of salt because um, it depends on your body composition. It depends on how fit you are. Um, depends on how strong you are uh, generally. It depends on your cardio, your strength, and um, where, how that's distributed around your body in terms of um, specific muscular strength and what have you. So I think, I think you need to be a little bit careful about that. Personally, my advice would be try and carry as little as possible, whatever your weight is, whatever your fitness, whatever your strength. Because at the end of the day, um, if your pack's too heavy, it becomes miserable and of course there are times when you have to carry heavy packs you have to go long legs where you're carrying lots of food and at the end of the day you're talking about kit a lot you can you can nudge around the margins of kit weight but the biggest thing that's going to make difference to your pack weight is how many days you're out for because that's going to make a big difference to how much food you've got to take that's it that's the big thing you're, you're talking at least seven, if on a proper hiking trip you're talking at least 750 grams of food per day i would imagine for most sort of reasonable trips at least and um, you multiply that up over a week or 10 days you start getting a lot of weight um, and maybe you, you need to carry a little bit more than that depending on the circumstances depending on how big you are depending on how many calories you use depending on how cold it is um, so that is what's going to make a big, big difference. Once you've got your baseline kit broadly sorted, um, so big things that, you know, I, I started that lightening the load series. It needs to be finished at some point. But one of the big things, the thing I started with, number one, was sleeping kit and camping kit. So tarp, bivy bag, uh, sleeping bag, sleeping mat. You can make kilograms of difference depending on how you choose that kit. Lots of people over specify the warmth of their sleeping bag. They um, carry heavy old synthetic bags. They carry heavy sleeping mats. They carry big, heavy, thick tarps, and it all weighs kilos and kilos. By contrast, we've been talking about tarps, reduce the weight, silicon nylon, down bags, lightweight sleeping mats, lightweight bivy bag or a lightweight tent, however you want to travel, a lightweight hammock and tarp setup, you can bring the weight down massively. And that's that's a big thing. Um, so personally, I, I do have, um, I've got a, a number of, of, of synthetic bags that I use um, and then kind of run of the mill bags. The synthetic sleeping bags tend to be cheaper, they're easier to look after, they're easier to clean and um, they're much less expensive of course uh, said they're cheaper um, down bags are much warmer for their weight and on a journey when you're having to carry the kit where weight is important down bags just come into their own so i have a number of down bags as well um, i've got an old two to three season bag that i'm using at the moment it's really good um, i've got that super lightweight pretty much two season bag for mountain equipment that you've seen in one of my videos that's great for summer use as well anyways about 600 grams and then i've got a four season pertex endurance outer rab bag that i've had for years um, that's good for three to four season use you know even like cold spring nights frosty nights into the minuses um bivying out bivy bags it's it's absolutely great that bag and then i've got a warmer down bag still that i use on on cold weather trips so you know ski touring in norway norwegian mountains and you know arctic trips in northern scandinavia etc so you have to choose horses for courses of course but you're always going to get the most warmth for the weight with a down with a down bag um, a lot of people say they're too expensive um, 
some manufacturers are cheaper than others, um, depending on what features you want, where's, where's the down sourced, um, how ethically is it sourced, all of those sorts of things. Um, but look at a number of different, look at RAB, look at mountain equipment, look at ALP kit, look at PhD designs. You will find something that suits you and your bracket. And then some people will moan about, oh, I don't like mummy shapes, they're too tight. Well, that's, <laughs> maybe you need to lose some, I'm being frank here, maybe you need to lose some weight. Um, a lot of people who find, you know, a lot of really lightweight down bags are made for mountaineers and they are generally quite lithe, quite lean, quite muscular, um, often reasonably tall as well, although not always. You know, you're talking kind of quite slim for the height, a lot of mountaineers. And those real lightweight down bags, expedition kind of climbing bags are made for those guys. They're not made for fat blokes in the woods. Unfortunately, I'm being blunt there. Um, and so that is, that is one of the issues. So yes, you might have to buy a bigger, older bag. Um, but again, that brings me on to, you know, I'm being blunt there. If you want to hike, and you want to reduce weight, and this is something I learned a long time ago um, with the cycling, for example. I got into mountain biking in the early 90s, and it was a really interesting transition time back then for, for mountain biking. Suspension forks were just coming in. I originally started doing a lot of cross-country riding with a, with a full-on hard, not just a hard tail, just you know hard frame. It didn't have suspension forks. It was just rigid and um, then you, you started getting G-Flex stems and um, uh, was it G-Flex, G-Shock, G G-Flex? Um, yeah, it was, it was like a stem with a little shock absorber in it with a hinge and then they were quickly superseded by you know, Manitou and Rock Shocks and Pace made some good forks. And, so there was some, there was some good stuff came out. Um, but still, <clears throat> people would be changing the bolts on their, <laughs> on their water bottle carriers, you know, steel bolts that came on the bike, putting titanium bolts on and saving a few grams, you know, changing the bolts on their chain set where, it, um, where, the, where the chain wheels attached to the, the cranks, changing those for, you know, titanium sets and all of that kind of stuff. You know, you could get replacement titanium bolts for where your Shimano XDR um, group set attached or the derailleur attached in the back and all those sorts of things. That's fine, you might save yourself. You, those, those things do add up, but frankly, <laughs> if you're a bit overweight, the best way to lose weight on the bike person combo is <laughs> to lose some fat off your body. Um, and it's the same with hiking. Um, you can get the, you know, you, you're going to have to spend a lot of money to save kilos and kilos and kilos of weight on your equipment. You know, titanium cook sets, expensive down sleeping bags, etc., etc. Or just eat a bit less for a number of months and you will lose the same amount of weight off your body and you won't ha be having to carry that. As long as you maintain your strength, that's as good a way of losing the weight off the pack and person combination as spending hundreds if not thousands of pounds on expensive lightweight gear. So you've got that as well. Um, and I'm being, being a bit blunt there, but I, you know, and it's no, I, I've no idea what size you are. These answers are always supposed to be general in their application for people as well. But don't forget about that. A lot of people focus on the kit. Look at yourself as well. Can you get fitter and stronger? Can you lose some fat off your body weight as well? You can end up with a much better power to weight ratio as a result of spending three or four or five months on that than you can by spending thousands and thousands of pounds on expensive lightweight kit. That said, whatever size you are, going back to my original point, and this is why I've had this sort of slightly historical um, biographical uh, thread through this answer, that said, having loads of, however light you are and strong you are, having loads of weight on your um, skeletal and muscular structure all day is wearing. So if you can minimize the kit. Um, sleeping kit is important, I mentioned that. But then the other thing to consider is just people tend to take too much stuff in the sense of, Oh, I'll, you know, I'll take this, I'll take that, I'll take this pouch, I'll take this and that and the other. 
the end of the day, what do you really need? If you think about what you need for a day hike in terms of waterproofs, water bottle, first aid kit, map case, compass, etc., etc., what do you need over and above that for a few days out hiking? Well, you need a sleeping bag, you need a sleeping mat, and then you need something to sleep in, whatever that is, a tent or a tarp or a hammock. And as long as those things themselves are not too heavy, and then you might need a, a bigger cooking pot, you might need a stove if you're not having a fire, um, you might need an extra water bottle just so you can carry a bit more water, spare pair of underpants just in case, small wash kit, toothpaste, little toothpaste, toothbrush, face flannel, some wet wipes maybe, there isn't a lot extra there, but then people start getting, you know, if you're packing candle lanterns and, you know, all, you know, Ortley wash bowls and axes and all sorts of stuff that you might not necessarily need, your pack weight's going to go right up. And again, I see that. I see that with people coming on courses. They turn up with massive rucksacks. And that's on courses where we're supplying a lot of the kit. We're supplying the cooking. They're not bringing any food. Um, maybe they've got some snacks in there for, you know, just for their own, you know, personal choice or what have you, but they're not bringing, you know, we're feeding them for the week. We're supplying bivy bags and tarps, we're supplying cooking kit. Um, you should just about be able to turn up with a day pack um, for that. You know, of course, some people have bulky sleeping packs and sleeping mats and things, but um, I had a guy earlier in the year, um, I won't embarrass him by mentioning his name, but I was impressed by, he was a cycle tourer, um, he did a lot of cycle touring, and he, t he came to my elementary course with a pack that, this is my, this is a 30 litre uh, pack that I've got here with me today. He had a bag not much bigger than that, he had a sleeping mat underneath on the underside of it but he pretty much had what looked like a day pack with him for the week's course whereas other guys were turning up with 70 80 litre bergens full of stuff weighing a ton i've no idea what they had in there so that's part of the experience of traveling of knowing how minimal you can go and you can go really minimal and get away with it and be comfortable without then the burden of all that extra stuff so that's the other thing and then in terms of yeah it can be useful to have um, an, an, an inventory of your kit. I find having a, 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 a I used to be more organized with spreadsheets and things than I am now. I kind of know what I've got. I know what works. I go out so often that I, I have sets of kit that I know that sleeping bag, that sleeping mat that are for a canoe trip in, you know, this time of year, that one, that one, that one for just going out and working in the woods on courses where I'm not traveling too far, maybe going a few miles every day, or if I'm doing, you know, 15 miles, 20 miles a day on a lightweight hike, I want my best lightweight sleeping bag, my ultra lightweight sleeping mat, titanium cooking pot, etc., etc. That's all. That's all going in to a small backpack and I am I'm minimizing the backpacking weight. So I know that, but yes, you can do that in a, um, you can do that in a spreadsheet. And I think having an inventory, if you've got lots of different kit, having an inventory is good, particularly if it's not all stored in the same place. So you can have kit items and then you can have, where's it stored? It's in the box in the, under the stairs. It's, you know, it, it top of the wardrobe or whatever, you know, where, where do you keep it? It's in the storage unit down the road, whatever, whatever you've got like that. And then you, you're not having to, mess around trying to find things when you're planning a trip and then what you can have is another column of like UK three season hiking trip in the mountains and then you can just have a tick for all the items that you want and that's a really good way of just keeping your packing lists all in one place as well so you know where everything is you know what you need for each trip and you know where to find it um, as long as it goes back there afterwards, you know where to find it um, and you can pack very quickly then. Because that's one of the things that I find, there's a real friction point there. Uh, I try and be efficient with when I get home, getting unpacked, getting things cleaned, washed, sorted, back where they should be. And then again, when you're packing, being efficient with your packing, you, you have a good packing list, you know where your stuff is, you know where to find it and you can pack quickly. Because if I didn't do that, I'd waste so much of my life unpacking and packing and I'd spend a lot of time doing that already. So that's the way, get, get, get to a conclusion on what works under what circumstances, you know, different seasons, different types of trips, 
what works really well, what you need, have a definitive packing list for that. Yes, of course, you can edit it and change it over time and that will happen as you get something new or something wears out and you get a replacement, you get something better, you can, you can change your packing list. But being able to go, right, I'm doing this type of trip, this is what I need, tick, 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 that's super useful. And so, yeah, I would recommend that. Um, and weight is important, but I don't tend to do that at the packing. I don't tend to sort of add it all up spreadsheet wise. I just, I've just worked through many years of experience to get to a set of kit that I know is as light as I want it to be. Because the flip side of course is durability. You know, you can, you, I could spend, you know, <coughs> excuse me, I'm getting over a cold at the moment. <coughs> um, I could spend my time in the woods wearing lightweight trainers. I'd have wet feet all the time, I'd have foot rot. Um, and so I'm, I'm got, I've got heavier boots and you, you have to, uh, and also if I had lightweight um, footwear a lot of the time rather than leather boots in the woods, they'd get trashed going through brambles, going through undergrowth, etc. the work that I do. But equally, if I'm in the hills, I might want something lighter, but in the UK, they'd still need to have some sort of waterproof ability. Um, if I'm in arid areas, then, th then they don't. So again, it's, it's you specifying durability, weatherproofness, protection of the body and, and weight. So weight isn't the only parameter is what I'm saying. So I don't just try and optimize down that line of minimizing weight. Yes, it's an important consideration, but equally things need to function properly and things need to protect you. Um, you know, if you're out with a gossamer thin, uh, flimsy waterproof, in your trainers and shorts in Snowdonia in April, um, you've probably got it wrong. Yes, your kit's lightweight, but you're probably gonna get hypothermia. So. <coughs> right, that was a, there was a lot of questions in there, but hopefully that's useful to different people, different reasons. This question is from Trevor, clever Trevor. His question is sleep rotation for Firewatch. Hi Paul, I really appreciate all of your instructive content. So much for, so, thanks so much for all you do to make such knowledge readily available and easily comprehensible for those of us to tr trying to improve our ability to work with nature rather than against it. Um, so his question is, suppose two or more individuals were in a situation wherein they need to keep a fire burning all night long. Suppose they were forced to build a small enough fire that it wasn't practical to build a good self-feeding apparatus and the fire may require periodic attention over the course of an hour or so. For such a scenario, might I get your thoughts, please, on how an effective sleep rotation might be assigned? Would it be better to have one individual stay up half the night, then swap out, or would it be better to divide the job into short hour rotations? If the latter, how long might you suggest these shifts be? I suppose this question might also relate to keeping watch over camp for security reasons, but as I've been unable to find any reputable guidance on this subject, I'd really appreciate any professional input you'd be willing to share. Thank you for any of your valuable time and uh, you spend on reading this. Sincerely, Trevor. Well, Trevor, it's a good question. Um, and it depends on exactly the scenario you're talking about um, in terms of the answer, the general answer about sleep uh, rotations and fire rotations and whatnot. Um, so the times you need to keep a fire going typically through the night are when you need it for warmth directly. So that can be you're sleeping right next to the fire. You've built a shelter. You have a fire in the shelter. You're sleeping. You need it for warmth in the shelter. That's a reason for keeping the fire going. Other reasons for keeping a fire going overnight is you've lit the fire by friction but your 
but it's been a lot of work. It's not something you feel like you could easily repeat. You could be low on food, you could be low on energy. You feel that it's touch and go, it could be really wet, touch and go as to whether or not you get that fire lit again if you let it go out. That's another reason why you'd want to keep it going overnight. Even if you had the means to light the fire, it's, it would be a struggle, perhaps. And then the other reason, um, heated tents, and I've talked about that before, you might need to do a, a stove watch um, overnight, both in terms of keeping the tent warm, but also in terms of making sure the fire doesn't die down and smolder and start causing issues with incomplete combustion and carbon monoxide poisoning and smoke in the tent and all those things as well. So, and I've got experience of all of those things. And the thing I would say is that if you're relying on the fire for warmth, then unless you're completely and utterly, absolutely exhausted, you will wake up when you start to get cold, when the fire starts to subside. So you get the fire up and this can be in front of a fire in the open or inside a shelter. Um, I've done both many times and you get nice and cozy and you doze off and you go to sleep and you're comfy and then you start to feel a chill. You start to feel a chill around your, your neck and on your shoulder or the side of you that's away from the fire. You start to feel a chill generally and you'll wake up and then you do something about it. And hopefully you've got fire there, firewood there that you can put on the fire and, and stoke up the fire again, it gets nice and warm and cozy, and then you doze off again. And that, that is probably what we've been doing as a species for a long, long time. It just seems quite natural once you get into it. What you have to get over mentally is this idea of eight hours solid sleep. Um, I'm a good sleeper and I will, at home, I will go to sleep and I will sleep, and I can sleep for eight hours without waking up, unless I've had a lot of water or tea or something to drink before I've gone to bed and I might need to get up in the night for that, but I can, I can sleep and, I, and I, I don't tend to have fitful sleep. I don't tend to um, just wake up for no reason. Um, switch my brain off, go to sleep. That said, and the reason I say that is because then when I'm outside, my sleeping pattern's very different when I'm having to rely, say, on a fire for warmth. I'm waking up when I get cold. Um, I'm waking up when the fire gets smoky. I'm aware, even though I'm asleep, you're aware of the, what's going on with the fire and you wake up typically. Now, if you wanna keep um, the fire going and have a fire watch yeah absolutely you can do that and there's there's no there's no issue with that and particularly if there's more than one of you that can be a good thing to do um and if you're going to do a rotation i would suggest do it on the basis of 90 minutes to two hours and interestingly i was talking to sarita robinson about this recently and again uh, check out the second podcast I, I did with her episode 21 of the paul kirtley podcast um, we talked a bit about sleep cycles and sleep rotation there, and it seems like you have a natural sleep cycle of about 90 minutes. And if you sync your fire watch with that 90 minute cycle, so you, you know, maybe you, you have two hours each, where, including the time to get up, to get in position, sit and get some firewood on the fire, sit in front of the fire, go back to sleep. And so you're sleeping in sort of 90 minute, two hour blocks, and you're your fire watch 90 minutes to our blocks that works quite nice quite nicely it's easier the more of you there are uh, we tend to do that with winter camping trips where there's four of us in a tent we designate a 10 hour period like quiet time because uh, it's dark a lot of the time anyway so 10 hour quiet time sleeping period and during that period every one of the four people in the tent has a two hour fire watch stint um, you're still going to get your your sleep in that 10 hour period um, and everyone does their two hour watch and that works well um, in shelters i found say where you're making a group shelter where there's three or four of you in there 
I found that you don't tend to need to have a formalized watch as long as you've got a good supply of firewood in the shelter and you're and somebody wakes up to throw a couple of logs on the fire. Um, this whole idea about self-feeding fires, um, you know, there's this, uh, you, you see that sort of silly photograph which goes around the internet occasionally where you've got the fire in the middle and you've got these two stacks of wood feeding in. Uh, that's complete garbage. Um, it, it's got no, it, it, it's a fun little trick thing, sort of Heath Robinson style, um, but, in terms, of, in terms of the amount of heat it's going to kick out. If you've got long logs going into a fire, where you get the radiant heat is along the length of the log, but you've just blocked it with that stupid stacking system. So if you're lying along the side of it, you're going to get the end of a, you know, the, the, the cross section of that fire, which is small. That's not going to heat you bodily. Um, if you want a fire to keep you warm bodily, you just put a lot of wood on the fire. You know, the classic long log fire, the newing fire uh, that you get in the, in, the north of, in the north of Sweden, for example, uh, two different um, main uh, types, the three log long log fire and the two log long log fire. The two log tends to, to, to burn more steadily. It's harder to light but it burns more steadily and is less smoky. The three log, long log fire burns somewhat more rapidly. Um, and once it dies down a bit, it does become a bit smoky um, as the log start, the top log starts to burn up and away from the others. Um, but I've spent time out like overnight at minus 20 to minus 30 in front of those without any sleeping equipment and they're absolutely fine. Um, doing little fires, little little kiddie fires with self-stacking systems feeding into them, that's not going to work. Yeah, you're just wasting your time um, with that stuff. And I'm not saying you do do that, but there's a lot of crap out there on the internet where people have not got any experience of applying these things properly. Um, look at what people have done in the past when people had to rely on this stuff and and, and apply that first yourself and figure out why it works and then play around at the margins if you want to. I'm, I'm, I am not averse to innovation. If somebody comes up with a new way of doing something that's better, that's more efficient, more efficient in terms of preparation time, more efficient in terms of application, I'm all for it. But what I get annoyed about is people with no experience, very little experience, doing stupid things that they've thought up on their, on their own time when they're away from the woods and then doing it in an afternoon in the woods, taking a photo of it and posting it on the internet and it goes around the internet going, oh, look at this. It's garbage, most of it. Yeah, stick with the classic means of having a fire that keeps you warm and you won't go wrong. That's the problem. You know, I don't, I don't come up with a new way of plumbing a house when I'm sat in the woods and, and sort of make a half-assed version of it and put a photograph of it on the internet going, oh, look at this, guys, you can replumb your kitchen like this. Or, oh, I've just figured a new way of piping gas into my house, even though I'm not a certified gas engineer. But with bushcraft and survival, you get that all the time. And unfortunately for you guys, those of you that are watching this, and people who are interested in actually getting the proper skills, there's so much noise and crap out there that it's, people get diverted off down these alleys. And yes, I'm having a bit of a rant and I haven't had a rant for a while and I feel, I feel good for that. But it's important, yeah, there are some classic proven ways that work. And so in terms of, if you want to lie down in front of a fire and, and stay warm, it needs to be a parallel fire, whether they're big logs or small logs, the principle's the same. You want something that is like a bar fire, a grill. So if it's you and your mate, what you wanna do is put a long, a long fire that's at least as long as your body, say six foot, seven foot, whatever, have a long fire, have it burning along a good amount of that, giving out heat along a good amount of that and then you lie down in front of it so that you're getting that heat along the length of your body and your mate your friend your buddy is on the other side of it getting the heat that's coming out the other side of the fire that's the best way not these little fires not fires with funny feeding systems um, and with a with a with a parallel lay fire like like campfire cooking you cannot with campfire cooking like with your oven at home, set a temperature, 
cook for an hour and a half and your dinner will be done. You can't do that with a campfire and cooking. You've got to monitor it, you've got to manage the heat. It's the same with keeping yourself warm overnight. You can't just set a fire, go to sleep for eight hours and expect to be consistently warm the whole time. You'll have to manage that fire. It will get warmer, it will get colder. You want to have a good stack of firewood there so that you can feed it onto the fire when you need to. That's the best way and then either do just have an agreement that one of you when you wake up and you're cold that you chuck some logs on or that one of you sits up for a while and then gives pats the other one wakes them up come on mate your turn you have a good sleep they keep they keep the fire nice temperature while you sleep for a few hours that's the other way of doing it um, and like i say if you can organize that say on a two hour cycle um, that that in my experience works pretty well so hopefully that's useful and don't get distracted by all these self-feeding fire nonsense um, contraptions on the internet. And we'll come back to that in a minute because I can... Oh, actually now, I know there's a, there's a fire... Another fire question from Sean. <laughs> Dear Paul, in regards to erecting a wind or fire deflector near a campfire, is there a minimum and maximum distance that the deflector can or should be before it's either too far from the fire to effectively reflect the heat back towards you or too near the fire that it catches a light itself? I've watched quite a few camping videos on YouTube now and seen people put up a deflector only for it to be burnt down by the end of the video. What is an optimal distance to maintain heat without the deflector itself igniting? All the best, Sean from Essex. Well, I think you actually mean a fire reflector, Sean. Um, I know exactly what you mean. Um, again, this is one of those things that goes around, goes around the internet in particular, as you mentioned, YouTube without there being a really thorough understanding of what's going on. It's almost like people have seen it somewhere else and it is in some old woodcraft and camping books. They've seen it somewhere else and then they've done it because they think they should do it without thinking, why am I doing this? And for those of you that don't know, what Sean's asking about. Sean's talking about having a fire and then you're on this side of the fire, the fire's there in front of you and then on the opposite side, on the far side of the fire, away from you, there is a uh, construction which normally involves putting a couple of upright stakes into the ground um, and then having uh, some rounds of uh, wood stacked up so that the uh, you have a vertical or near vertical face of wood on the opposite side that um, many people claim then helps with radiant heat because it reflects the, the heat that's radiating from the far side of the fire it's reflected back towards you hence fire reflector some people also claim that it it helps with drafts. So let's imagine you've got a fire, you've built a one person open fronted shelter, whether that's a, a freestanding debris shelter of the sort I might teach people to do here, whether it's a, a, a lean to the sort of thing I might teach people to do in coniferous woodland, particularly in um, the boreal, you may even have a raised bed if it's seriously cold so you can get some warmth up and under the bed and again there's plenty of material on that on my blog um, and I'll put links in the show notes, there's going to be a lot of show note links today. Um, and then you've got a reflector on the other side and you're talking about wind to start off with. Well you've got the orientation of your shelter wrong, just plain wrong if that reflector does anything in terms of wind and the fire. Because you want the back of your open fronted shelter with the fire in front of it to be neither away from the wind or towards the wind. You want the front neither away or towards the wind. So if the back of the shelter 
is facing the wind. You get the wind coming over the shelter and then you get an eddy current, just like you do in a river with a rock, with the water going around a rock, you get an eddy current coming back towards the obstacle and that blows smoke into the shelter. You don't want that. Equally, you don't want the shelter facing the wind because you're gonna get cold wind coming in and equally, you are going to get the smoke again. What you want, ideally, is the wind going across the front of the shelter so it's not cooling you. You've got the shelter coming round, got sides on the shelter so that you're not getting cold, um, but it's taking any smoke away from you, not into the shelter. And if you imagine you and a friend have got an open fronted shelter each, so a sort of step up from the previous question where you're just lying in front of the fire, you've got a little shelter here, you've got a fire in the middle, parallel fire, and then you've got a little shelter on the other side, clearly you want the wind going down the middle, you don't want the wind coming any other angle. So that's the orientation. So a deflector is not going to do, deflector, reflector, I'm saying it now, is not going to do anything to help with that. Yeah, that's the first thing in terms of wind. Guy running through the woods jogger trespassing the public foot there's not a public footpath here um, but it's good to see people out in the woods so that's the first thing that then in terms of how much heat now those of you that have read my material and other people's material where they have experience with using fires and shelters um, in combination without sleeping equipment in cold environments will tell you that to stay warm with a fire in a cold environment you really need to be just a step away from the fire like if you if you put the fire too far away from you and as you rightly ask about uh, reflectors but the most important distance to get right is the distance you're away from the fire now, don't worry so much about other things how far away are you from the fire? And I constantly see people getting this wrong. They have too small a fire and they're too far away from it. To stay warm in a properly cold environment, so whether that's sort of in the hypothermia bracket of plus six to minus six Celsius or colder, yeah, to stay warm in that type of stay warm in that type of environment, you need to be a step away where you're being properly physically warmed by the fire. Yeah, not just you've got a fire going and you're sat there, you, you want to be, feel like you could actually start taking some layers off perhaps. Yeah, that's, that's how you want to be warmed. And you want to be a step away. So if I've got a raised bed and I literally have just enough room to walk in between the fire and the bed if I'm using the fire to keep me warm. That's the distance, right? So you get that right. Now you're gonna put a reflector on the other side. Are you gonna make the reflector the full length of your body? Probably not. So you've got most of the reflectors that I see on the internet and I'm sure you're asking about are maybe at most three feet, maybe at most a meter long. The one, you know, two upright sticks, some some more stuff that looks like firewood across stacked up. Like f radiant heat or radiation in general follows an inverse square law, which means that if you double the distance, you quarter the heat. If you, um, you sort of you get this exponential decay, if you like. Yeah. So, if I put the fire four times as far away it's gonna be a 16th of the heat. So getting, getting the fire and you spaced correctly is the most important thing. But then think about that you've got radiant heat going from the fire to that reflector and then all the way back to you. Even if that reflector is 100% efficient and reflects all of the heat <coughs> that gets to it, by the time it gets back to you, it's like being four times away, four times the distance away from the fire. So you're not getting a huge amount of heat back, and that's if it's perfectly reflective. It's going to absorb some of that heat, and yes, it might re-emit some of that later on, but, <coughs> excuse me, um, 
the amount of heat that comes back is going to be small. Um, wood is not a particularly reflective surface. Yeah. Um, it's not shiny, it's, it's angular, it's dull in colour, it doesn't reflect a lot of light, nor does it reflect a lot of heat. So as a thermally efficient reflector, it's not a particularly good material either. And so I don't think, and I don't know if anybody's ever done any proper scientific studies of this, but just, just on the basic physics of it, on the nature of the material and the nature of how heat radiation works, um, I don't think there's much point in building them if they're just going to be there supposedly to reflect some of the radiant heat back across to you. <clears throat> that's, that's, you know, that's me putting my line in the sand. I think they're a waste of time from that perspective. What they are good for is, <clears throat> if you're in a cold and wet environment, is just warming up the firewood before you put it on the fire. Um, bringing it up from minus 30 to plus 50 is going to help, <coughs> excuse me, when you put, I'm turning into Bob Fleming here, it's going to help when you put that on the fire. The energy of your fire um, is not going to be taken up with warming that material up to a level where it's going to burst into flames. It's not going to be driving moisture out of the, out of the outside. If it's got moisture held in there and everything's got moisture, this has got moisture in it. Even dead standing stuff has got a bit of moisture in it. Um, so the more that you can prepare, you know, that in a damp, cold environment, it doesn't have to be minus 30, just, you know, cold, wet, hypothermia-ish where you, you know, that kind of cold, wet, damp day, in December, in January, in March, in uh, late October when it's raining and it's cold and the leaves are coming off and it's starting to sleet, that kind of stuff. Being able to warm and dry your firewood before it goes on the fire, that helps. I think they're good for that. Um, but reflecting heat back to you, nah, it's, 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 it's insignificant. Um, and then you talk about some of them lighting fire. Actually, if you do light fire, to, if you do set them on fire, then they act like a grill. You're actively warming. You're getting that secondary warming effect. You've got your fire and you've got your reflector on fire. That's going to warm you up with it more than anything that it's going to do passively. So, and I've used that to cook meat, actually. Um, if, you've got a, if you've got a leg of lamb or venison, um, you can you can create that reflector setup, set fire to it, and you've got this grill that's like a kebab grill. You've got your meat, and you've got this grill, and you've got that raging heat in a short distance, and that that works in terms of cooking. Um, and that's often one of the best things to do with them. I I've seen in the old some of the old woodcraft and camping books. Let bits of meat hanging from a pot hanger type arrangement or a crane type arrangement, a little bit of fire underneath it, and then or a little bit of fire, a fire here, and the reflector there, or reflector on the other side of the meat, various different arrangements. The reflector doesn't do anything unless you set fire to it. And once you set fire to it, it makes a difference to the cooking. In terms of reflecting heat of the fire back to the meat, it does nothing. It does nothing at all. Um, so yeah, so use it for warming and drying firewood use it for actively warming things or don't bother at all is is my is my view on that hopefully that helps <clears throat> last question this has come via instagram plantagio major as a healing agent Question is, uh, this is from Jersertek. What are your thoughts on Plantagio Major? Was told it is every bit effective as yarrow for wounds, cuts, antiseptic, etc. Any truth in that statement? And I have to say, that's a lovely little drawing. Um, I know I've taken a while to come around to answering this, but thank you for taking the effort to draw that and putting a nice little post on Instagram. It's much appreciated. Well done, good effort. Um, so to answer the question, yes, it is an effective um, healing agent. Um, 
Plantagio Major, Plantagio Lanceolata as well. Um, you can, uh, so we're talking uh, broadleaf plantain and ribwort plantain here. Um, wrap them on a wound just, just to cover it and to give a bit of uh, protection as a starter, that, that's good. Any of the plant juices that can get into the cut, they will help with antiseptic and they'll help with anti-inflammatory um, anti to a certain extent, they'll help with healing. Um, if, you, if you manage to crush up a leaf and put that on almost like a poultice, so we're just talking in the field as you go, and then another leaf wrap around and the leaves are quite stringy, both, both species we're talking about quite stringy and so you can actually form quite a good um, wound dressing with them as well. Tying them off can sometimes be a bit difficult, but you can certainly wrap it around and, um, and cover. And then um, if, you, if you want to go to the extra stage, if you actually um, heat up the leaf in water, um, in a bit of water and, and sort of mush it up a little bit so it kind of goes like cooked spinach and then put that on a wound, that's very effective as well for bites, for stings, for burns, for cuts. Um, it will help with the healing and keeping it free from infection with all of those things. So yeah, it is good. Um, I'm not sure it's as much of a styptic as yarrow in my personal experience. It is Allegedly, it does have some styptic qualities, so I it will stop bleeding. But I found dried yarrow, so where you've got yarrow and you, you dry it and it, it looks like a, a little packet of dried herbs in your, in your first aid kit, and you put some of that powder on a, on a cut, it stings like hell but it does, um, it's like a sort of natural form of something like uh, one of those um, hemostatic uh, powders, um, not in the same category of product at all, but it does definitely help. It soaks up the blood, it definitely uh, causes, it helps stem the bleeding, and it definitely helps um, mat and knit the cut together again. Um, and so that the arrow helps for that. So I think they're both useful to know about, um, definitely both useful to use. So you tend to use the, the plantains wet and the, uh, I think the best use of yarrow is when it's dried and, and put onto a cut, whereas the others are good on other sort of wet, hot um, things like bites and stings and burns and cuts that might be a little bit inflamed already or certainly sore. And that's it. Some long answers there, some short answers there, all very good questions, all to do with what we do outdoors in terms of the equipment we take, how we live when we're there, and how we use natural materials when we're there, and how we operate as well. The sleep stuff is important. You know, people are asking those questions means they're really thinking about how they practically apply these skills in the real world. You're not, not just going to the woods and playing around with tools for the day and then going home again. You know, people who are asking about how do they set tarps up properly so they get a good night's sleep? How do they do fire rotations properly so that they stay warm, they get a good night's sleep? How do they make fire reflectors work if they work at all? All of these things are important because that's what counts, that's what matters. Um, practical application of the skills, knowledge of nature, combining those with personal experience so that you can actually use these things um, in a real way, not just play around and theorize about them on the internet. That's super, super important that we keep this thread of reality through the middle of this subject, which sometimes seems to get lost. So thank you for your questions. Thank you for your attention. Um, links in the show notes and I will see you on episode 57 of Ask Paul Kirtley before too long. Keep those questions coming in and in the meantime take care and enjoy the outdoors. Cheers.